Hey everybody, uh, HW here, and I have a quick little presentation on mob mentality, especially this term right here, de-individuation. Uh, de-individuation, um, which essentially means uh, if you take a look at the word, uh, de, right, de and so uh, not, um, individuation, so individual, you see that word in there? Uh, so it's like the removal of your individual self. Uh, and we know that that happens in mob mentality and mob situations. So uh, I'll go ahead and start this thing all fancy like in proper order. All right, so there's the first slide. We are gonna go to the next one. Oopsies, here we go. Uh, first process of individuation is the bringing together of the personal and collective unconscious into the conscious. So think about that. Uh, the bringing together of the personal, right? And the collective unconscious into the conscious. Personal, collective, unconscious, and we've got. So essentially what's, what it says is uh, you're taking uh, what's unconscious, what's going on uh, kind of behind the scenes in your mind, and then you're taking the personal, the, your personality, and you're kind of bringing them together, and you're creating uh, essentially an individual. Um, if you're a younger kid, then oftentimes you uh, will identify yourself as an other, right, or as a role rather than as an individual human. Um, so the whole, the whole concept of me is me in relation to other people. And at first it's, it's about a family, right? So I'm a son, I'm my mom's son, I'm my dad's son, uh, or I'm a daughter or whatever, I'm my brother's brother, I'm my brother's sister, uh, that kind of thing. So you're, you're kind of defining yourself in terms of where you are uh, with everybody else that you live with and in your, in your world. Uh, and then you become a student, right? I'm a first grader, I'm a second grader. At some point, right about now-ish, for, uh, for high school students, uh, that process then becomes a little bit more solidified and you start recognizing yourself as an individual. Um, so it's not like you don't have a personality beforehand, it's being shaped, but now at this point, it's kind of in, in early adolescence, and um, you know, middle school, early high school, um, that process uh, is basically the process of becoming an individual, um, separate from a collective identity, uh, in those early roles that I just talked about. So like I said, it happens about right now for you students, uh, if not like in, in you know middle school, somewhere in that age. But right, you know, adolescence, uh, it doesn't happen before that. Uh, also, it's something that can change. Uh, your concept of the individual is, is an ongoing process, right? So your concept of yourself, your self-identity, that kind of thing, is an ongoing process, uh, and it can change as you get older, as, as you know, life events happen to you. Um, but, but, from like from this point on, like you see yourself as an individual. So the individual itself changes, not necessarily your role, um, as as you define yourself as a role. I don't know if that makes sense. If not, send me an email, uh, and I'll try to clear it up later. So next up, uh, the de-individual. So that that first one was was individuation. It was the process of becoming an individual. This one is de-individuation. Is the removal uh, of that individualness, right? That that identity. Um, it's the process by which we lose our sense of self as separate from societal mores. That's that this term right here is pronounced mores. Uh, according to these three, in, in a study in 2005, um, deindividuation is when a person no longer feels constrained by social mores because they can no longer be recognized as individuals. They become essentially part of the collective. Uh, and for you Star Trek fans out there, that's like the Borg, uh, right? Is um, resistance is futile? I think was the the catchphrase that the Borg used. But essentially, like they they would fold you into their collective identity, and once you're in, like you're in, you can't um, you know rip yourself away from the Borg unless you're Captain Jean Luc Picard. Uh, he's excuse me that moment of nerdiness. So um, you might think like, oh, this is this is the bad stuff, right? So this is where people like feel like they can get away with murder, and then they do get away with murder because they're part of a group. Or, yeah, yes, uh, that's coming later, but uh, some in de-individuation is not harmful at all, um, right? So, I mean, if we play this, um, this is the first Timbers home match, uh, April of 2011. I just wanted you to hear this. Hopefully you can hear it. Whoa. 
Whoops. Um, where was I? I think it was right here. Here we go. All right. So yeah, like I said, this was, uh, as I wrote here, one of the most memorable experiences in my life. Honest to God. Um, it, it was absolutely electric. Um, but what I wanted to show you, the reason I showed you this particular clip is because there's a whole stadium, uh, essentially, of, of humans all doing the same thing. Now, I, I don't normally, you guys, anybody who knows me well enough knows this, I don't normally go around yelling and screaming and clapping my hands. It just, it just doesn't happen, right? Um, I'm, not, I'm not a very effusive uh, person emotionally. Uh, you get me in that stadium, though, and I go, I, I act like a crazy person because uh, everybody else is acting like a crazy person. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs just like everybody else. I'm singing the songs. I'm clapping uh, along with everybody else. Uh, I'm hurling um, uh, not niceties at, uh, at opposing players and refs when they do bad things. I've changed. But, the, but again, it's not, I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm not doing anything terrible. Uh, I'm not you know, uh, undercutting my morals or, any, or anything like that. It's just I, I just acted differently in this group because everyone else is, is acting uh, differently. Here's another one. I might, uh, is it, oh, it's unavailable. Darn it. Anyway, this was one from 2013. Uh, I have another one uh, just because it's gratuitous and I can't not play it. Uh, here's this one uh, from just last, uh, last, last year. And you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but the stadium's huge. And you can't really tell in the audio, but it's a lot louder too. All right. Anyway, uh, like I said, it, like I act differently in this stadium um, than I do when I'm on the uh, on the YouTube's uh, trying to teach you guys about stuff. What does that mean? That means that I've lost a little bit of my individuality in this collective uh, fan base that's cheering uh, mightily for the Portland Timbers football club because that's the team you cheer for. Um, when I root, I root for the Timbers. Sorry, I had to get that out of the way. All right, uh, some of you um, might know this also. So do you regularly circle up whilst older people take the center, sing at the top of your lungs, and then at a given moment collapse the circle and dance with abandon? No, I don't either. Um, but you, some of you do, if you've been to a dance at RPA, and again, this is weird to say right now with the distance learning thing, because we didn't really have dances this, uh, this term. Um, we might have one, I think, one or formal. Um, anyway, uh, we didn't get to do this at prom, uh, obviously, because there's no prom. Uh, but this is, this is the, the, you know, the last song of, of most of the dances at RPA. Uh, and you, know, you guys know the drill, right? Every, as soon as this song starts playing, everybody gets up in a circle, right? And, and the, the underclassmen and everybody else is on, on, on the outside of the circle. And then seniors are in the middle. Uh, and they're going to do their thing. Like almost everybody knows the lyrics to this thing. Um, and it's kind of a cool moment, right? And uh, everybody's at this point singing at the top of their lungs. And like it's kind of a cool thing. Right, uh, and then you know, as soon as that the one uh, the intro stops, the, and then everybody collapses in, and it's just a good time. And everybody dances, uh, and it's awesome. It's also an example of deindividuation, right? Like you don't normally act like this, but when you're in that crowd, you will do exactly what everybody else in the crowd is doing, and you're going to follow those uh, those new that new set of rules. Um, so, when is it harmful? Well, you, I mean, you could probably think about this uh, without you know trying too hard. It's harmful when people no longer are beholden to the social mores that provide for moral, ethical, and responsible behavior. When we feel like no one's looking, or that we can't get caught, we might act in a way that suggests de-individuation. Um, so, like I said, when, when, I'm in the, when I'm in the stadium at the Timbers game, uh, when you guys are at a dance, and we experience this de-individuation, we lose our individual self, and we act um, along with everyone else in the crowd, that's fine, so long as we don't do this, right? So long, long as we don't jeopardize our moral, ethical, or our responsible behavior. Responsible behavior, right? Um, in a stadium, it might be uh, more acceptable, more acceptable, just because of the because of the group and the crowd and the crowd crowd uh, characteristics, for me to to you know yell an obscenity at the top of my lungs. But I don't do that walking down the street. Uh, right, I'm, if, if I'm driving in my truck downtown, oh, nice job, buddy. You just got five out of five. Uh, if I'm driving my truck downtown Bend uh, and someone is in the crosswalk, I'm not going to roll down my window and like hurl an obscenity at that person. Right, that's just not something I'm going to do. It's not responsible, and it's not. It's just it's not something that's that's the right thing to do. 
Um, now, out of context, uh, same thing, you know, same, same thing applies to the stadium, right? I mean, that's not normal to hurl obscenities at someone. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not like some foul mouth dude that gets all, you know, wasted and throws beer and like, you know, is a sloppy mess and just like, you know, picking fights everywhere. That's not, that's not what happens, right? Uh, some of those chants that you heard uh, have swear words, you know, embedded in them. And so when you sing them at the other team, then you're, you know, you're hurling an obscenity that way. It's not like I'm, again, some hooligan from 1980s, you know, Liverpool FC fan base. Um, anyway, speaking of hooliganism, um, one of these days, assuming we get a June term back uh, or a Jan term, I might do I might do one just about this very thing uh, about hooliganism in the 70s and 80s. It's a fascinating, dark, dark time uh, in uh, in football history. Anyway, there's that. So when does it look bad? When when is deindividuation de bad? When we lose these moral, ethical, and responsible behavior, right? Okay. Uh, Here's something that I want you guys to do, and and at some point I'll just ask you to pause the video and, and do the thing, and then um, and then click play when when you're ready to get going again. But here's a question that I would ask in class if if we were sitting in class: If you could do anything humanly possible with complete assurance that you would not be detected or held responsible, what would you do? Ten things. I usually ask students for ten things uh, that they would do if you could do anything humanly possible. Right, so it's not like I'm going to disappear and then reappear on the other side of the world like that. No, no, it's, if it, you have to be able to do it right now as a human being. Uh, but if you could do it as a human being, according to the time-space continuum and like you know physics, uh, what would you do if you had complete assurance that you would not be detected or held responsible? What would you do? Take a couple minutes, uh, jot down your answers on a scrap of paper, uh, or just think about them for a couple minutes. Uh, and then when you're ready, click play again on this uh, on this video, and you'll see kind of what the results uh, were on this particular study, because this this actually was done in a in a psychological study. All right, so hit pause, think about it for a second. If you can do anything humanly possible, uh, knowing that you wouldn't be detected or held responsible, what would you do? Okay, hit pause, and I'll talk to you on the other side. Okay, here are the results. One psychology professor uh, evaluated data from 10 college psychology classes, that's 10 college psych classes, uh, introductory and social psych, as well as three classes of students incarcerated in maximum security prisons. So like these are bad guys, right? Like they, they're in a maximum security prison. Um, they're not at the county lockup because they had a bad night. They're not like, you know, at some club fed because uh, they're for some, you know, white collar, blah, blah, blah. Or you know, Anyway, these are like, you know, they're, they're in a maximum security prison, so they're, that should tell you something about their, um, their socialization. Let's just put it that way. Not saying that all criminals are bad, right? Not saying that they're all guilty, even, by, 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 you know, uh, by extension. What I'm saying is that they, these students in the incarcerated maximum security prison represent a different socialization group than the college psych classes. You would assume that someone in a college psych class is different sort of person than someone who's been incarcerated in a maximum security prison. Okay, let's just be honest about that. Again, I'm not throwing judgment. I'm just saying two different groups, right? Okay, out of that sample size, 10 college classes and three classes of prisoners, out of both, right, across both, 36% of the responses of both groups were antisocial. So about a third, just over a third of the responses were antisocial, meaning that they are... Um, Essentially, they're they're done to hurt someone else or uh, someone else um, that you get the benefit at someone else's expense, kind of a thing, right? Antisocial. Um, Nineteen percent of those were non-normative, simply uh, things that um, were not the normal way to do it, but they weren't necessarily harmful or anti. So they didn't fall, you know, quite to that level. Uh, for example, uh, I might um, something that's non-normative for me uh, would be to wear uh, very um, informal clothing uh, if I were to go to work, right? So that would be non-normative for me, right? Not antisocial, it's not, I'm not doing anything. Uh, antisocial would be if I, if I were to like flash you guys uh, or like not come to school with clothes on at all, that would be antisocial. Uh, non-normative would just be something different, something out of the norm for, for myself, right? So 19% of the, of the responses are non-normative. 36% are neutral, so about a third, just like this one. So about a, 
just over a third are antisocial. About a third are neutral, meaning they don't hurt or harm anything. Uh, and then only 9% are pro-social. This means like helping other people, right? Like uh, sneakily going into someone's house and like depositing $100. Something like that would be pro-social, right? Um, something that you normally wouldn't do, but now that you're able to get away with it, um, you, you're able to do that. So pro-social is, is, is for the benefit of society. Antisocial obviously is, is at the detriment of society. Non-normative is something that you would not normally do, but it doesn't fall under an antisocial thing or an illegal thing. And then neutral is just like it's not doesn't hurt, doesn't help. Okay, pretty surprising results, right? A third, and this is from both, right? From both, there's no there was no difference according to this professor. Uh, there was no difference between the responses from the college site kids uh, and from the prisoners, right? Uh, which is, you know, uh, it's noteworthy. From the same study, responses. Uh, frequent responses included criminal acts. Again, this is from both. This is from college kids and from prisoners. Uh, criminal acts, 26%. Sexual acts, 11%. Spying behavior, 11%. Most popular response was rob a bank at 15%. So 15% of the respondents uh, across the board said they were going to rob a bank. Uh, almost, and this is the one that really gets me. Among most antisocial responses, all of them were from college students. They were murder, rape, and political assassination. The most antisocial responses were all from college students, right? Not saying that the, that the criminal uh, folks didn't provide antisocial ones, but the worst ones, right? The, the ones that were like, I mean, look at this list, murder, rape, and political assassination, right? Those are terrible things to do. Those all came from college kids. Isn't that crazy? Um, but anyway, those were the three that, uh, that were the most common in the antisocial realm. Okay, so uh, that's it for, for this presentation anyway um, uh, of mine. This is a, a piece of a, a longer presentation where I talk about cults, uh, but that's for a different class, and so I just kind of pick and choose. Uh, this week for you guys, de-individuation uh, is the concept, kind of mob mentality kind of thing, what happens to you. Uh, and so that's this one. There's also a quick little uh, five-minute video or so uh, about a similar concept, uh, and then I'm asking you guys to hop over to a, uh, a website that talks about the Stanford prison experiment. Um, uh, Zimbardo, I think is this guy's name, uh, the, the uh, researcher guy. So d click on that website and just like uh, cruise around a little bit and, and, and click on some of the videos and then just learn about it. Um, fascinating, uh, very fascinating experiment and, and research topic. It gave us uh, some pretty good insight into what happens in the human mind, but also it raises some red flags about ethical uh, applications of psychological experiments. All right, everybody, uh, that's it for this. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If not, um, I'd say leave a thumbs down, but I don't ever check the analytics, and plus nobody ever watches these anyway. So uh, there's that. Have a great week. Uh, we will talk to you guys at some point in the near or distant future. All right, adios.